Isaiah chapter number 17. We're going to read three verses, starting in verse number 9. <clears throat> in that day shall the strong cities be as forsaken bow, and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there shall be desolation. Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation, and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. Therefore shalt thou plant pleasant things, and shalt set it with strange lips. And the day that thou shalt... In the day shalt thou make thy plant to grow, and in the morning shalt thou make thy seed to flourish, but the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and of desperate sorrow. Now, Isaiah, obviously, strong uh, warning here, not only to Israel, but also to Syria. Now, why was it that Israel was getting this very strong warning? Well, verse number 9, it says, In that day, talking about the day of destruction, the day of captivity, the day of Syria being overthrown, and then somebody else coming in. Israel, like a very, very, very you know, undesirable thing, changed hands a few times from the time that they went into captivity the second time. First time, they stayed in Egypt the entire time they were in captivity and bondage. Next time, a few different nations, a few different empires... Everybody rose and fell, but Israel never ascended back to what it once was because they had forgotten God. I mean, that's what verse number 10 says. Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. And therefore, that means because of those two things, you're going to plant, and you're going to plant it with strange lips, meaning you're going to plant it saying prayers the strange God. You're going to plan it trusting in the wisdom of foreign sorcerers or, you know, mystics. But then when you reap, you may get something out. It didn't say that they wouldn't reap. It said that they sowed, but it said the day that they did reap, but what would that day be? In verse number 11, it says, the morning that shall make thy seed to flourish, but the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and of desperate sorrow. The day that they went to go reap it, it would be full of grief. And a day, not just of sorrow, desperate sorrow. You know what that tells me? Well, you could put a tomato seed in the ground and get 12 tomatoes, but if the world's on fire around you, what are those 12 tomatoes worth? They put it in the ground hoping that it would sustain them, but when there's nothing left to sustain there, there's no reason left for living what good is it having a little bit of food a little morsel that would hold you up what is it what good is it to have a chunk of gold if nobody wants to buy it what good is it if some pieces of silver or a wedge of gold in a Babylonian garment cost you not only your life but the lives of everybody in your family day of desperate sorrow when you're so sorrowful that, like in the end times, when the Lord reveals himself and people really get a good glimpse at God, that they cry out to the rocks and hills to fall on them and crush them. Because just the very sight of our God lets them know there's no hope. Sorrow comes as a result of no hope. You can't be sorrowful if you got hope. It may be bad, it may be hard. But there's a reason to keep going if you've got hope. Sorrow and hope are like oil and water. You can't mix them. Now grief, you can feel grief, but still have hope. You can feel sad, still have hope. You can feel dejected. You can feel depressed and still have hope. But sorrow and hope can't have both of them at the same time. Okay, We're not going to teach on any of that, but that's just what he's talking about in these verses. What we are going to teach on, out of verse number 10, we see a strong warning. We know the second half of the story, what happens to Israel. How even though the Syrians are defeated, they weren't allowed to go free. When Babylon fell, they didn't get to go back to Israel. Then when Rome fell, by that point, Israel was so scattered that they didn't have a home anymore. It wasn't until 1948 that because Britain decided to give it back to them, 
that they had a land, a nation of their own called Israel, but even then they had to fight for it for a while. There were those that said, nope, we're not going to give the land to the Jews. And then Israel, by, you know, just ignoring what everybody else said for a little bit, just started buying guns and weapons and everything else. And then they went in and they took it. What should have been theirs all along, but why wasn't it theirs? Because they had forgotten their God and they were not mindful of the rock of their strength. And it's that word mindful that popped out at me. Now, what does that word mindful mean? Now, if you say, well, I'm mindful of something nowadays, because people don't use words like that anymore. Mindful to some people might say, well, you think about it every once in a while. That's not what that word means. If you think about something every once in a while, I don't think about putting gas in my car every day until the little red light comes on and says, hey, you need gas. Yeah, and I mean, I've got it worked out so much that I know, really, how many times I need to fill up in between each paycheck. So I, I've got it down to a science, right? Fridays only. It's the only time I'm, unless I'm doing some extra driving, I don't need gas on Fridays. Don't need to worry about it six other days of the week. That, that's not called being mindful. That's just something that you forget about until you remember it again. Okay, Israel, certainly at this point, throughout all of God always promised they have a remnant. There were those that were still worshiping God the way that it was intended to be done at this point in time. They didn't worship like we worship today, but for their time, they followed God. They did as God commanded. In Jesus' day, there were those that were seeking God, doing what you know they believed God would have them to do, but then Jesus showed up and said, doing that's not enough. You need a Savior. And then once they got in, they started, well, eventually, after you get through the book of Acts, you find the churches we know today. But what was of the people that were in the remnant? They were doing things the right way. There were those that were following and seeking after God, but the majority of them weren't. A lot of them went through the motions. Nah, we're not going to get on the Catholic Church. I already said it. We might as well do it. There were a whole bunch of people for a whole long time that the Catholic Church said, you give us enough money, you say enough prayers, doesn't matter what you do, you're good. We'll pay people to pray for you if you give us enough money. But what do you think that the Pharisees in Jesus' day were doing? With their deeds, with how much they gave into the treasury, with how much they taught, with all the things that they did, they thought that they were buying the favor of God. No, they weren't mindful of the rock of their strength. They were their own strength. Israel had stopped relying and having faith in that God would do for them what they cannot do for themselves. Why did David get in trouble for numbering the people of Israel and know how great his army was? Because it took the faith out of going into battle. If you know how strong you are, it doesn't matter how strong God is. Well, yeah, we, we should be able to take, it, take them. But every time that they went into battle before that and done well, it was because God told them to go into battle. David paid the price for that, by the way. Because he did it out of the strength of Israel instead of relying on the strength of God. David was a man after God's own heart. You're telling me that he didn't think about God all the time? Well, in that moment, he wasn't mindful. In that moment, he had no strength because he had forgotten the rock of his own strength. Who was that? That was God. I mean, how many times did David in Psalms write that he was his strength because he learned that lesson? How many times do we find after that that early will I seek thee? Because I want to be mindful of God. So if mindful's not every now and then, mindful's not once or twice a day. Mindful's not, well, during morning devotion, every time that I eat food throughout the day and then before I go to sleep. That's not mindful. Best definition that I can find for mindful comes from Psalms. Very popular verse. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visiteth him? If God is mindful of us, that's our definition of mindful. 
Not a second goes by that God doesn't know exactly where you are, what you're doing, the very thoughts and intents of your heart, and what's going to happen to you the rest of the day, and how he's trying to direct you into the best course for your life. And it's true for all of us. There's never been a time that God was not aware of you, know exactly where you are, exactly what you needed, and when it was going to get to you. And I'm not just talking about since you've been alive, since the beginning. What is about new you, new you, before he formed you in the belly. When he was hanging on the cross, he already saw you because he had already known you. Because omnipresent doesn't just mean everywhere at once right now, it means everywhere at once all throughout time. How do you think he showed John what was going to happen in the book of Revelation? Because he's already there. That's why he already sees us seated in heavenly places. Because he's seen us over there. Because he's already there. You say, explain that. I haven't quite wrapped my head around that one yet. If I figure it out, I'll let you all know. But chances are, not going to. But mindful literally means your mind is full with that thing. Because used to, that's how they made words. Well, if you're full of something, we'll just add full to the end of the word, and it means everything in your brain, everything on your mind is that thing. That's how God thinks of us. And because he's God, he can do it for everyone at the same time. He has no limitations. But say, I'm not God. Neither are you. But yet, we are instructed to be mindful of the rock of our strength. Mindful of God. To not forget the God of our salvation. So, what we talk, it's not a weekly thing, it's not a daily thing. It is a second by second ordeal when it comes to your spirituality. Because, I mean, I think we read it last week out of the book of Ecclesiastes. As a fly is the ointment, so a little folly is to a man, to his honor. What's that mean? All it takes is a small mistake. Spoil the whole thing. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. What's good for the goose is good for the game. A little bit of unmindfulness or forgetfulness can steer our entire life off course. You think Israel started with everybody being unmindful of God? No. But it started with one king or one priest or one person not caring enough to stand up and say, well, I don't care what he says, we're going to do it the right way. Well, I don't care, because why didn't people rise up and overthrow kings that tried to destroy the house of God, replace it with temples to false gods? Because most of them were on the same boat as that guy. They wanted the false god because they knew that they could live the way that they wanted to. You are mindful of the things that mean the most to you. Who are the people that you text throughout the day, the people that mean the most to you? Who are the people that you pick up a phone and call, the ones that mean the most to you? Why did you call them? Because you thought of them. We become unmindful when God doesn't mean more to us than other things that can take precedent on our mind. We become unmindful when our the thoughts, desires, the lust, if you will, although I don't like using that word, when the lust of our heart are not for godly things. You can lust after righteousness. You can do it the right way. Most of the time it's just called a zeal because lust has a bad connotation to it. But what is mindfulness? What does mindfulness look like? I can give you definitions all day long. I can give you, you know, example all day long. I don't know how your brain works. Okay? I barely know how my brain works. Okay? And I've lived with it for 27 years. Okay? Haven't figured it out yet. And I also know, Brother Peter, I'm weird. I think different than some people. Most people. 
right? So I don't even know if I tell you what's going on inside of my head is going to be relatable to you. But I've got a problem with every second, every day, being mindful. Because here's how my brain works. I don't know. You might be this way too. Okay. I, my brain is a freight train. Okay. It takes a whole lot, you know, of time to get going. But once it gets going, it doesn't stop. Right? And then, just because it's going in one direction, doesn't mean I can change directions real quick. It's real hard for a train to change tracks. Usually they either got to stop or slow down real, you know, real slow. Somebody's got to throw a switch, and, or they've got them big rotating things where they pull onto that and it turns the whole train around. Right? It is an ordeal for a train to change directions. Well, you know what I found? And I've been, I've been working on it. God's been trying to work on me. But if I was in the middle of doing something, if somebody came and asked for something, it was an inconvenience in my brain. Because I'll know I have to change directions. When I sit down and I get going on something, that's what I want to do. Even if I don't like doing it, I just want to get it over with. Right? Well, what happens to a car that pulls out onto a train track and they don't see the little you know bars that flow down the flashing lights that car ain't left by the time the train gets through but that's generally what happens with things that pop into my head while I'm working on something I forget it why because I'm too focused on this and I found that while at work while out running errands while even sitting at home I became so invested in A that everything else didn't matter and really got under conviction because if I'm at work, for instance, I may bump into or say hey to 50 people a day. Well, what if one of those 50 people, because I'm too focused on A, I don't hear the Holy Spirit say, ask them how their day's doing. Tell that person you're going to pray for them. I became so mindful of what's in front. Now, granted, I could, because... Let's be honest, I tried when the conviction started to justify what I was doing. Well, I'm supposed to do everything as under the Lord. While I'm on the job, I should be working. That makes sense. Right? I'm supposed to be a good steward. I'm supposed to earn the money that people are paying me. But at the same time, is five minutes out of my day to talk to somebody really going to derail everything that I was doing that day? No. And if the Lord was my boss... Like if the Lord employed me let's think of it that way would the Lord take offense to me taking concern in somebody else's spiritual condition rather than my job I can stay five minutes late but that may be the only time that I can ever talk to that person witness that person and because I'm in freight train mode I'm just ignoring it well then there are people that kind of like me and then there are people, I call them uh, CD players. Some people don't know what CD players are anymore, but I remember them. Uh, you know what a CD player is really good at? Changing tracks. Freight train, can't change tracks. CD player, change tracks all the time. Right? Their brain is able to say, okay, well, pause this for a second. We're going over here. I, them people are weird. I don't trust them. Okay, it doesn't make sense to me. Okay, I don't understand how they can do that. I've got enough trouble with one iron in the fire, let alone 12 of them. Okay, but those individuals I have found, because I've worked with some and you know I've had to try and help some people, because that's part of my job nowadays, but those people are too easily distracted from what's right in front of them. They can be mindful for a moment, but mindfulness is not temporary it is a state of being pray without ceasing that's part of being mindful constantly having an avenue open to not only talk with God but to listen to God receive instruction allow the Holy Spirit to bring back that verse to your remembrance because anybody ever see that movie up what about the house and all the balloons on it the Pixar movie there's a dog in that movie named Doug. Doug gets easily distracted. 
And about nine times throughout that movie, he just goes, squirrel, and then looks off the screen. And then there's just dead silence because everybody's waiting on him to finish the story. Those are people whose brains train tracks a little bit too easily. Now, that's an exaggerated form of it. But people that can get to a certain point, the danger in that is that you never get back to where you were before and finish it. What good is it if you go out to play in a field and you get nine rows halfway planted? You did all the work to start it, but then you did all the work of moving the plow before the job was done. Now, maybe there was a reason for it. Maybe, you know, you can only go so far in this lane because you got too many roots and everything. Else. You're going to have to come back and do work later. That's fine. I don't know how you operate. That don't make sense to me. Okay, I'd rather get one, one row plowed really good than do about eight of them a quarter of the way. I just, I'd rather know, okay, I did one today. That's just how, that's what makes sense to me. But you know what doesn't make sense to me? Getting so focused on something or allowing to be so easily changing our focus that we leave God out of our life. Again, can't talk about you. But you still, you know, back when I had a little bit more time for lunch because now I'm rushing. I got to get back as soon as I can. I'd get in the car and I'd say, all right, Lord, where am I going for lunch today? Because I don't know who's working to drive through at whatever restaurant. I don't know if somebody needs to receive a track as I go through the drive through window. But I didn't want to become a creature of routine. and Because let's be honest, I could eat Skyline every day of the week. I can go through a Skyline drive through get lunch, I'd be happy. Right, but then one day God said, well, what if I don't want you to go Skyline day? Good point, Lord. But now, when you're on a time concern, I got to get back as soon as I can. Right, the whole COVID thing hadn't opened up yet. Everybody's not back at the office. We're, everybody's doing like eight different jobs right now. Right, well, that, what's that mean? I don't have much of a lunch. I got to get back and do the other jobs. Well, what is the danger in that? We'll become creatures of habit. Well, I've either got too many things to worry about or I've got one thing that I've got to finish by the end of the day and I'm just going to go get the thing that's closest. Thankfully, I don't do that because the thing that's closest is the frishes. I don't know if I can eat frishes every day. And I can't eat Chipotle every day or else I might end up you know, in the ER. Like, what happened? I don't know. His stomach's just gone. It disintegrated. I can't do that. But what is the dang the danger is, well, I just I gotta go and do this right now. I'll just get whatever's quickest. Well, if we start thinking that way, well no, I don't have time to talk to that person. It's distracting. No, Lord, I don't have time to get away and go pray right now. I gotta finish this. No, Lord, I I don't have time to make a note on a post-it note. I've started taking screenshots on my phone of Bible verses that I'm reading because I'm afraid I'll forget them before I get back and finish studying out whatever it was that I was studying. You know how I figured that out? Because a few of them, I forgot them, and it took me a while to go figure out which ones they were again. What is the danger? That we become so entrenched with what's in front of us, enthralled with what's in front of us, focused, which isn't a bad thing, but when our focus becomes so pinpointed that we leave God out of it, then it's a problem. We're not mindful anymore. But see, mindful doesn't just mean thinking about something or having your mind on something all the time. Mindful also means in what order you evaluate things. Somewhere in the back of your head, you are always thinking about, well, hey, I'm going to need food soon. And depending on how long it has been since you've had food, that thought starts climbing up the chains of things that are important to you. Generally, it's when your stomach starts growling and you think, oh, I need food. Hey, I'm, I'm hungry now. And then what takes precedent? Well, I'm, I've been this hungry before and I lived, so it's not that important right now. Right? And no, nah, I've, I've been this hungry before, but you know, it's starting to get a little uncomfortable. And then there's, I need food now, get out of the way. Right? Well, same thing with every other thought in your life. Whatever is most important to you 
is what's going to get your attention, your concentration. Okay, you can have a lot of different things on your mind, but you can tune some things out for the time so that you can focus on one. It's one of the tools that somebody has to master or at least become proficient in if you ever want to have you know, a successful prayer life is tuning out the flesh, tuning out thoughts that the devil's inevitably going to try and put in your head. Right? Tuning out distractions or tuning out phone calls, things that are going to draw your attention away from talking with God. If you ever want to study the Bible and get anywhere, you're going to have to learn to focus on this regardless of what's going on around you. Right? Well, it, it helps when you actually want to do what, you, what you're doing. It helps when you desire, but if it means more than just, well, I like doing it, or I'm going to do it once a day. Well, what if God tells you to pull out your Bible on the job? What if you get some bad news and God says, I got a verse for you, but you got to do it now? What if, unbeknownst to you, you're going to run into somebody later on in the day and God wants to bring this to your remembrance so that later you'll have a word fitly spoken? Mindful individuals always have God so close to the front of their conscience, their awareness that he's always able to talk to them. It's those that get so entrenched in routine. It's those that have what you know scientists would call an addictive personality. They just move from one thing to another because it's, oh, hey, this is great until it's not great anymore. They've got to find something else and something else and something else. Right? And they just kind of like locusts, they suck all the joy out of this thing for them and they have to find something else. And they just keep bouncing around trying to find something that will sustain them. Well, if we've got that kind of mindset, right? There's a whole lot of joy in here. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. But if I forget the rock of my strength, if I'm not mindful of Him, I'm not going to get any strength when I get into this book. Mindfulness isn't just priority. Right? The thing that's most important to you is what you're going to think about. Mindfulness also has an intent behind it. God is mindful of man. He's mindful of you. God isn't just mindful of you to receive worship or to receive praise or to receive somebody's service as a result of He's God. He can do all of it Himself. God is mindful of you because He loves you. God is mindful of you because He doesn't expect anything in return, but He does ask. He asks us to love us, or love Him like He loved us. God is not mindful of you for His gain. He's mindful of you for your gain. So why should we be mindful of God? Not for my gain. That's selfish. Well, if I do it, then maybe later on I'll get a blessing out of it. No, if you're doing it to receive, chances are you're going to receive what you wanted right then and there. That's either the praise of man or you know, the respect of man. I don't want any of that. Last week we talked on, I want God to be exceedingly glad in my life. Well, why should we do it? Well, I can't do anything for God. Right? Well, Lord, what do you need today? Right? It's the dumbest question anybody ever said. Lord doesn't need anything. But there are things that He desires for us to do. Why? Well, sometimes it's because it's what's best for me. Other times it's because that's what's best for others. Why was God mindful of me? So that others, me, I'm one of them others that the world would receive his son. But when I'm mindful of the Lord, what's the end goal here? Well, first off, I want him to be pleased with me because I do love him. But then also, if I'm mindful of him, he's going to direct me outward. Sermon on the Mount. You're light of the world, salt of the earth. 
What does that involve? Going out. Mindful individuals get out of their own head and start thinking about others. Because every time God brings something to their mind, it's, well, look at that person. Or, hey, you may not know why, you may not understand why, but go do this thing right now. And then in hindsight, God will reveal to you why. Or maybe he won't. Doesn't matter. If God says do it, do it. But we all say, well, if God told me to do something, I'd, I'd go and do it. Right? If, you know, Lord says yes, then it's yes. If Lord says no, it's no. But how often are you going to hear him if you're not mindful? How often are you going to receive direction if you're not paying attention? Because yes, daily devotion, very important. Daily study, very important. Daily prayer, very important. But how often do the most critical and important things in your life happen during your daily devotion, during your daily study, or during your daily devoted time of prayer? Life happens outside of your prayer closet. And if you tune God out, as soon as you leave the prayer closet, you're going at it alone. Just like people in Israel's day, just like the Pharisees. Well, they show up when they're supposed to. They say all the things that they're supposed to. And then they live like the world as soon as they step outside the doors. Because they think what they've done is good enough to hold them over until the next time they come back. That's not being mindful. That's being facetious and taking advantage of the grace of God. Praise be to God that he winks at our ignorance sometimes. Praise be to God that when we get too focused on self or too focused on job or too focused on world, that the Lord does show grace and mercy and gives us a space of grace. But this thing's winding down. I mean, I've heard a whole, heard a whole bunch of nonsense. Heard a lot of things. I was like, hmm, never thought of that before. But what it all boils down to is we ain't got much time left. We do know that a generation it used to be 40, God extended it to 70, and he said if you live over 70, you're blessed. Okay? God doesn't ever put a cap on what a generation is. I mean, Methuselah lived to be uh, a little bit older than 70. Okay? A generation is a group of people. And as long as one of them's left, that's still a part of that generation. Okay, well, like I said earlier, Israel legally became a nation in 1948. I think it was May 15th. Might have been 14th. Can't remember. Well, 48, well, plus 70, that's 18. We're already on borrow time. But then the question is, well, God doesn't use the Greco-Roman calendar. God uses the calendar that he made. That's a Jewish calendar in the Old Testament. I don't know that one, but I do know it's close. It's not going to be off by 10 years. Right? It's usually off by a few days. That's why Easter is on a different day every year. But I do know that God also, I don't know when God said Israel became a nation again. Was it when they were legally declared by the British to have their own nation? I highly doubt it because God doesn't think too much what man's government say. Was it when 800,000 of them were settled? Was it by 1958 when 2 million of them had returned to the land of Israel? I don't know. But I don't need to know. I look around and I see a whole lot of things that were prophesied coming true. So how much more important is it today that we be mindful than we were, more mindful today than we were yesterday? I do know this. When the church is raptured out of here, tribulation isn't going to happen a hundred years after that. It's not going to happen a month after that. It's not going to happen a year after that. It begins then. Right? They go hand in hand. Well, in order for one man to stand up and say, I have the answer, and everybody to get on board immediately, it's got to get real bad while the church is still here. It's not going to be a corona. right? It's not going to be that, well, we're going to have another great recession or great depression. No, no, no. Stock market's going to have to hit zero. Probably go negative. 
People are going to be bartering and trading because the money in their back pocket isn't good anymore. There's going to have to be so much desperate. It's going to be verse number 11. People that thought that they were sowing and that they would reap, they're going to go to see what they reap, but it's going to be in a day of desperate sorrow. Who cares what your mobile app says is in your bank account when a dollar doesn't mean anything anymore? Well, what are you saying? Well, I'm saying that those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. God takes care of His own. Righteous aren't going to be begging for bread. Not going to be forsaken. But the world's going to get real bad. You thought two months being boarded up and everything being closed was bad? You know how bad it's going to get for those people that for two months said, hey, I'm an American, right? Let me out of my house. I have the right to go do what I want to do right now. And some places like Tennessee were actually like, yeah, this is all stupid. We're keeping everything open. Uh, I almost moved to Tennessee, moved in with you guys. Uh, needed a haircut a few times. But what's the point? You thought that was bad? That was a wake-up call. It was only by God's grace that one, if it was as bad as they say it was, which I'm unconvinced, but if it was that bad, if it was black plague status, you won't realize that two-thirds of the world's population died during the black plague. If it was that bad and just by God's grace, it didn't kill that many people. If it could have happened that way, if a third of Americans were left, America's economy could still function. People survived the Black Plague as bad as it got. So imagine how much worse it's going to have to be for the Antichrist to just stand up one day and say, hey, I got a plan, and then everybody go all in on it. You know how miserable and sorrowful and desperate people are going to have to be to immediately join on to something without even thinking about the consequences. Because I know, well, I'm pretty certain Russia's going to make it through. Right? Pretty certain that the EU's going to make it. Don't find America anywhere. You know how bad it's going to get for America to have to sell out to everything? Where they just chip up the, the states and say, all right, we're going to sell this to Canada. Sell this to Europe, sell this to China. It's going to get bad. When you realize that, how much does it really matter what I have for lunch today? When you think of that, how much more important is it to listen, not to the people that you're talking to, you should listen to them, but listen to that still small voice inside you that says, hey, invite that person to church. Why? Well, that person may be saved on their way to heaven, but they may be living out in sin. God wants to rescue a prodigal. Hallelujah. But everybody that doesn't get in, one, if they've ever heard a clear cut presentation of the gospel, as soon as the tribulation starts, their eternity is sealed. And what are the chances that somebody, after I'm off the scene, is going to be pillaging through my house and pick up this Bible? and find the plan of salvation in it. I know some are going to do it. Because the Bible says that many are going to come. I know that some are going to refuse the mark of the beast. But it's not going to be everybody. Because when every nation turns against Israel, I know how high the blood's going to get when the Lord opens His mouth and a sharp two-edged sword comes out of it and they all just die. When the blood's as high as the horse's bridle, that's a lot of people. I haven't done the math on it, but it's a lot. It gives us new perspective on what we should be mindful of. But see, it takes effort. It takes a change of who you are to be mindful every second of every day. You have to become the new creature. Because the old desires tend to creep up. The desires of the flesh can be made to seem very, very urgent. But I mean, let's be honest. We all could make it if we had to put off lunch for 30 minutes. 
Most of us be able to be able to make it if we put off lunch for the rest of our lives. Okay? Just didn't eat it. But what do we focus on? What's most important to us? But the things also that are most urgent to us. And the things that we are most invested into. There are a lot of things that don't mean anything, that aren't worth anything. But people still go out and do them because they're invested in it. I mean, Jesus, Jesus wherever your treasures are, that's where your heart will be also. There are some things that people just treasure even though they're not worth a plug nickel. I mean, really, I think it's funny. All those people that used to take off vacation to go watch March Madness every year. I thought it was hilarious that March Madness didn't happen this year. You know how many March Madness games I've watched in the past decade? About two. And it was usually only the replays of the ones where like the 12 seed ended up beating the big seed or the 16 seed winning that one year. I was like, yeah, that's pretty cool. But what, what are the things that we value? Why do we come so, become so focused on one thing that we just ignore everything else? Because it might be inconvenient to the flesh or to what game plan we had when we woke up that morning that somebody wants to take five minutes of our time that may have everlasting consequences. Why do we become so involved with everything, kind of like Martha? Well, I've got something in the oven. I've got a, we've got a whole bunch of guests that we didn't know we was going to have today, and now I've got to serve them dinner, and this, 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 this. And she played every track in her brain except for one, and that was the one that Mary was most concerned with. What track did she miss? that the very God of heaven was sitting in her house and had raised her brother from the dead. Very easy to let that happen. And I've already told you, I'm guilty of it. Right? It's not like I'm saying, well, if I can do it, you can do it too. No, through the strength of God, we can do it, but we have to be mindful of the rock of our strength. Amen. We must understand, I can't do it. God has to do it in me. Because it's a part of that new creature. You know why Isaiah wrote 66 chapters? Because that's how many God told him to write. It wasn't that Isaiah thought about God more or was more mindful of God than any of the other prophets. You study out the book of Daniel. That's a whole lot of Daniel's life. But very few chapters. Like God didn't tell him to write down all of it. And what he did tell him to write down, Daniel wrote down. Not all of it was about his life. A few of his friends were in there too. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. The whole book was not about Daniel, but from start to end, that takes up almost all of Daniel's life. Jeremiah and Isaiah didn't live, you know, six times before and six times longer than Daniel did. Doesn't mean that Daniel was any less mindful than the others were. Just because God doesn't tell you as much or give you as much to do doesn't mean that you're not being mindful. I want to make that clear. You may speak to 66 people in a week. You may speak to one, but if you're speaking to everyone that God wants you to speak to, that's all that matters. Maybe God's got a lot to do on the inside of you like me. And a lot of the things that you're being mindful of are directed towards so that when you go out, you can shine a bright light instead of one that's dim and hidden and got a lot of soot on the glass. But see, being mindful, if we leave mindfulness at the door, if we check it when we end our daily devotion or when we end our daily study, if we turn that little knob up well okay I've checked the box I've prayed today that's what the Muslims do I've got to pray five times a day minimum well I I went in and I took care that's, that's what the Catholics do well I went to confession today I said all the Hail Marys I said uh, all our, our, our fathers to put money in the offering plate I'm good no if we turn mindfulness off you're not really mindful at all because the very essence of Imagine what your life would be if God only thought about you when you thought about Him. Because that's the standard. We're supposed to be Christ-like. 
what a second that goes by that you aren't on the Lord's mind right now. Lord, help us if we get to the point that we're that way towards Him. But those people that made a difference in other people's lives, those that God really used in the Bible and through history, you know what they were? Mindful. They were more concerned about what God thought about their life than what they thought about their life. So they were always mindful of what he had to say. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.